Okay. okay. Well, this is uh, this is unprecedented and probably slightly improper at a conference like this to stand in front of a black screen. But I, I did um, sort of try to prepare a PowerPoint presentation, but I was advised by uh, some colleagues last night that I should probably uh, not not bother. I think that's probably good advice. Anyway, I, I have um, a couple of theses, and I'll try to. I think it's a good idea to state a thesis and make it as a, um, um, interesting and therefore um, vulnerable and a g fragile in a good sense, so that um, you know people can kind of have at me. Um, as it turns out, my the original um, thesis that I had in mind, I was straining as um, hard as I could to come up with something to do with space, and then um, I was listening rather avidly at lunchtime to people to talking about virtual space, and, and I thought, okay, I finally have something that can allow me to say something interesting about space in video games, and it basically it was going to go something like this, that the video game which, um, and, y and you can challenge me whether this is a game, but I think it is, the video game which I was going to, which I will talk about, uh, Second Space, with which, um, because it's been raised several times, I think everyone's probably got at least a cursory understanding of exposure to the, the game, um, ought to eliminate, um, so far as possible, the simulated spatial interface. Um, now that sounds like a rather facile thing to say, and so I'll make it a kind of definitional thing. I'll su suggest that the the um, essential definition of um, second space should probably work in this direction. So that, that's a pretty vulnerable thesis, but it's not as good as the two theses which I'm going to hijack, namely uh, Daniel's and um, um, Carl's. I'm, I think that some of the things I want to say sort of naturally also kind of lead drift in the direction of um, their theses, with which, uh, as it turns out, um, I agree. So, to jump into this, um, the the sort of conceptual pivot on the basis of which I'll sort of try to drift in the direction of these th three different theses is um, the whole question of mimesis, and so. I've divided my talk into several sections, um, and the first section is um, entitled The Value of Mimesis for Life. So it's a kind of existential aesthetic um, discourse that I want to, su want to suggest. And I, th I think it, um, it'll proceed this way. I'll say, I don't think arbitrarily, because I think I'm sort of um, pretty strongly situated in the tradition going back to Aristotle. Aristotle's reaction against Plato, I think, resists a notion of mimesis as mere imitation, copying, and even, now this, this part is a little controversial, um, even representation. So I, I want to start out with a, there'll be a slight kind of a reversal at some point, so wait for that. But I want to start off by saying that mimesis, in the Aristotelian sense, and then I'll, I'll, so I don't um, get bogged down in um, controversy over a Greek term, I'll shift to um, the English term, mimesis, in which I think I can safely say that there are people like Auerbach and others who use mimesis in a way such that it is not um, interchangeable with representation, and the two concepts are different. Qu quick argument to make the point. Mimesis would be more analogous to other devices, such as um, the most obvious example would be metaphor. For example, metaphor in the way that the late American philosopher of language, Donald Davidson, uses the term. And uh, metaphor, um, Davidson takes the strong uh, stance that metaphor has no um, semantic content at all. I disagree with that, but I do dis agree with that metaphor carries no propositional semantic content, because a metaphor, if it's, you know, untamed, it's, n you know, it's not a dead metaphor, it can um, suggest an infinitude of things. There's no way to contain the propositional content that it's meant to carry, therefore it has no propositional content. And I think that's also true of um, mimesis in the productive way that Aristotle uses it. For example, when he, you know, talks enigmatically about music being the most mimetic of the um, arts. That's a sort of a bewildering thing to say, but I think you can, 
see where this makes sense. On the other hand, Aristotle also you know, makes the famous um, claim that um, poetry, mimetic activity, is more philosophically serious, so it has a kind of cognitive content. This is the reversal which I was preparing for. It has a, um, it's more philosophically serious than history. History, of course, understood as um, just um, chronology or you know, accumulation of facts or maybe you know, big data, something like that. Um, now, that seems to be problematic for what I'm saying, that trying to separate mimesis and representation. So sort of that's a promissory note. You know, hold me to account later. I'll, I'll try to sort of make that clear. I'll say right now that I'll just sort of make the point simply that mimesis, um, um, mimetic activities have no pr um, propositional, no cognitive content. They're not um, in any way stating truth, just like metaphor. But mimes mimetic activities, art, can suggest a world of truth, and they can suggest a world of truth, and this is coming back to Daniel's point, they can make available a world of indeterminate truths more, in a weird way, more efficiently, more productively than um, treaties, essays, and straightforwardly cognitive um, you know, series of statements, series of propositions where, where truth, um, statements where, that explicitly have truth value. My, my mimesis has no truth value, but it can, you know, slight irony, I suppose, suggest, not state, but suggest um, more productively truth value. So, so that's the first um, thesis. So, so this pivoting point has already helped to add, I mean, Daniel's done all the, uh, um, where is Daniel, actually? I keep on pointing. Um, d d uh, so par pardon me. D uh, Daniel's done all the sort of heavy work, so I'm just kind of piggybacking on your thesis and adding sort of one more. If you understand mimesis is that arguably Aristotle understands it, um, I think that that will lead sort of toward your thesis. Okay, two, um, um, I was going to as a contrast point, but I don't want, want to run out of time, contrast um, second life with um, a, an educational game called Real Lives, but I'm going to leave that aside and just jump right into Second Life. The reason I'm attracted to Second Life is because I thought it might, um, just as um, interactive narrative machines, it might work as a particularly useful inter, um, interactive narrative machine. Normally, um, interactivity in the... Um, as I was reminded, this is a, a technical term which I'm probably using rather loosely, but interactivity tends to interfere with the development of a kind of complex, rich array of meanings that typically we find in works of art and novels and tragedy and what have you. And nonetheless, I think that um, it seems to me that um, Daniel's on the right track and so I think that there is a, um, a potent analogy, notwithstanding this um, crucial difference between works of art, which are um, not, in the sense that you had in mind, interactive. And um, I, I'm borrowing your language now, interactive narrative machines, which um, are highly interactive in a, in a special sense of the word interactive. Second life is um, a little strange in this way because it's um, far less structured than other video games. I, I'll call it an internet game. It um, leaves to the discretion of the player so much that it's really not interactive as most games are. It doesn't force the player to make a decision, do this or that. Things are pretty much um, left up to the players in Second Life, they can create their own um, reality. So I think um, interactivity generally, and this is, I'm sort of resisting slightly the direction of your talk, it would only be enriching in the way that art can if it, um, we'd have to go game by game. I don't think we can generalize, but I think that Second Life offers about as, would probably get as good as it gets because it gets to, comes to a kind of role-playing. 
the fact that it's operating um, on the internet, I think, might provide certain advantages and so might allow us to say something um, loosely that um, um, this particular game might allow us to do certain things which video games in general can't do especially well and that it might allow us to, to um, do things which traditional art also does, but perhaps not as well for the reasons you're suggesting, because they're not as interactive. So interactivity both interferes with the rich generation of meaning, which I think is very important for um, um, playing the role that um, ideally certain works of canonical, you know, perhaps works of art can, can play of um, changing our sensibilities, our worldview, just in the sense of you know, if you change some important beliefs, you've therefore changed your worldview, your disposition, and hence, because of these things, your way of being in the world. So in other words, works of art, um, ideally, um, have a kind of um, um, s uh, function of helping us to se overcome ourselves. They have a transcendent function. And I, I don't think people, um, often p people don't look at video games in this uh, light, but um, y your talk suggests that we maybe we, we should sort of shift in that direction, um, looking on a game-by-game -game basis. So, to, to Second Life, um, and this um, th will um, uh, sort of establish another little reason why I think um, Second Life, to get back to my first um, thesis, um, moving away from the, s the second thesis, why it should eliminate, this sounds wildly improbable, it's certainly not commercially um, um, a good idea, probably, for um, Philip um, Ro Rosendale, the, um, the uh, head honcho at Second Life, to consider, but Second Life should consider um, not um, um, making more impressive simulated space 3D. Um, over lunch hour, I thought, you know, we were having a little chat and we were sort of wondering about, you know, are still arguing over the nature of, of simulated space, whether it can be construed literally as real space or not. And uh, you know, I don't really have any strong views on that, but one can certainly enhance the simulation and one could make it more analogous to real space than the space that we're experiencing right now because of course we're bounded by our, um, con uh, unless there are quantum um, physicists in the room, we're bounded by our conceptual and mathematical understanding of space and by our perceptual um, apparatus. I, arguably, in a video game, you could not through um, sort of um, pictorially simulated space, but through symbols which would more accurately if, um, configure what space might more fundamentally look like that would be a possibility. Of course, the only people who would be able to play the game would be a handful of um, quantum physicists, I, I suppose. But it, it would be a more accurate um, way of um, configuring space. And this su su suggests, I'm not going to follow this through because I, I, you know, we're limited for time, but I, it suggests a kind of argumentum ad hominem. Um, it, you know, I could find other ways of um, doing it, but, that, but that, I think that's sufficient. A more accurate representation of space isn't necessarily a useful thing if you want to create a game which has the kind of um, uh, life-enriching, semantic, aesthetic, cognitive possibilities, um, suggestive possibilities of art that can sort of start to change your life. So um, my recommendation, but I'll, a recommendation is kind of, um, as I said at the beginning, facile, so I'll make it a definition. Second life, if it really does take seriously the notion of developing a second self, um, um, and entering a second life, then it should be construed as a mimetic activity, because if it's simply your first life masquerading in a second life, it's not really a second life. So if it, it, the most radical way to conceive of second life is to see both the environment being distinct, and even more importantly, I would argue, seeing the self being distinct, from the real self. So the, you, the self that you develop has to be a simulated self, what in fiction is normally called a character. So you have to, if you enter second life and you want to play the game um, in a, a way that is more essential than even um, the advocates and owners and promoters of the game 
the way that they talk about it, then I think it ought to be played um, as a totally simulated game, both at the level of identity and environment. And I think that the um, most promising way to do this would be, um, well, okay, I'll just, just spend that thought and carry it on in just a second. Earlier we were talking about the banality of evil. I think we can also talk about the evil of banality. And I think um, when you look at Second Life on a visual um, level and in terms of what people get up to, even when they get up to you know, interesting things, it's, an, um, it's a rather banal game. And I think that the banality is um, intimately linked to the efforts to um, simulate space and that if the effort was made to make space even more convincing, unless it went in the extreme direction perhaps of, um, but that would be kind of pointless, of representing space really accurately through uh, you know, linguistic mathematical symbols and what have you. Um, I think it, the game is going to be um, encouraging kitsch. This isn't a logical point, it's just a, for all intents and purposes, it, you know, just an observation. It seems to go in that direction. So I think maybe a, a kind of um, heuristic or a kind of um, radical um, definition of the game, which takes the, the possibilities of the game seriously, would say that Second Life is a mimetic activity which, if it's going to um, allow for possibilities of um, self-transcendence, self-overcoming, should take more seriously the cognitive aspect of mimesis. And I'm not contradicting myself, by the way, because uh, um, just to recapitulate what I was, the distinction I was making earlier, or, um, mimesis has no explicit cognitive content, but as I said earlier, it can um, more potently than um, explicit um, series of statements suggest rich cognitive content, and I think this is what se Second Life could do. And so I think Second Life should probably consider um, downgrading the visual interplay, making it purely functional so that it would encourage something like a kind of Bakhtinian world, a kind of polyphonic world, which would be even potentially, this is an ideal, potentially even more impressive than a novel. Well, it depends who wrote the novel. More impressive than a, than a didactic novel. But maybe it could even, in theory, if you had the, uh, the right people playing the game, there could be a kind of dialogic um, interplay, not in chat rooms, because I'm, then I'm, I'm missing the whole point of the game, not, um, not um, people exchanging ideas, but um, exchanging ideas, interacting with one another, talking about experiencing, developing w views of the world and expressing these views as characters. So people would have to play the game really seriously. And if they do that, then they would be in involved in a kind of radical hermeneutic um, function um, in the way that Nietzsche is an early hermeneutic theorist um, suggests that we should be expanding our horizons and this would be a way we could do so more so than when we're simply expressing our own religious, political, ideological you know, views, etc. in our own voice. If we adopt a mimetic voice and enter a game like Second Life, then I think Second Life probably could do what even the novel can't do quite as well because it wouldn't be one author trying to create a dialogic universe, a polyphonic universe with many voices competing. It really would be different people. So I think ideally if you had the right players, um, Second Life could, could go in this direction. And then, so th this, this is a recommendation and it kind of coincides with the kind of definition of the game and it'll come to my third, it'll, I'll sort of conclude now with my, the third part, which is really Jonathan's thesis, I, I never would have occurred to me that there could be um, evil within a game, in a sense, because I take seriously the mimetic um, function of a game. But in a sense, I'm um, getting back to the banality or the evil of banality point. If um, players who were playing the game didn't really, were just um, using it as an axe grinding section and were only expressing their own worldview, weren't taking the opportunity to express themselves empathetically within a different voice and expressing, you know, really seriously the worldview, uh, a new worldview, trying to discover a new worldview to express and exchanging 
use on that basis. Those players who weren't playing the game well in that sense would be committing a kind of low-level um, evil. Okay, thank you very much. I'll end on that note. <laughs> Just for Michael. Keep that on. Patrick has one. Okay. Uh, <coughs> no, um, I, I am. I'm questioning your uh, your your uh, kind of model um, proposal that uh, that seven second life is a game actually because yeah. uh, it's it's a sandbox. Uh, it's a sandbox where you can experiment. Uh, and you can play there, but I don't think that I don't think Second Life. I I don't know the others might ag might not agree, but I don't think you could. It, it would be formally possible to d to d distinguish uh, to to d define Second Life as a game, mm -hmm. uh, unless it's the game of life for the people who want to play that game of life inside Second Life. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> but I know that I know that people have. Um, I mean, I have um, a presence in Second Life, and I, you know, I have a uh, thing. But the thing, one of the things that annoys me a bit about it, it's a bit clunky to use. It's quite difficult and it's quite complicated. So, in the end, it becomes an awful lot of work to use it as well. So, uh, here you get with Second Life, you get this problem with the work and play aspect as well. If you want to create something, you you have to probably collaborate with other people, which is a good idea. Uh, <coughs> for example, the University of Torino has made a very good modelling of Piazza. What's the name? <laughs> piazza San Marco? No, not San Marco. I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, of a, of a very important piazza in the middle of, of Torino, which is extremely realistic in a sense. And I see that the people who, who are in the group, I mean, I know the people in that group, they go there and they, they meet each other and they talk about things, but they're talking about everyday life. Mm -hmm. Because there it's kind of a project that they're working on. So they're sort of in the, go in, in the square and they're chatting about everyday life and then maybe they'll be doing some work for to, improve the, uh, to improve the simulation. But mm -hmm. again, I, I'd say that's nearly more work than play. So it's research on their part, I think, they're doing to try mm -hmm. it out. So, um, so, so I would question your very idea that it's a game. But I don't doubt that you can play games in Second Life. Uh, and you can organize games in Second Life. You can even make a game mechanics in Second Life. But I, I suspect it's quite difficult to do because it's quite slow moving. So it's it's yeah. you know it's not it's not a very fast game engine <laughs> to play like that. Yeah. So uh, I mean, my my basic point is that I think that from an ontological point of view, it's not quite right to say that Second Life is a game, but it might mm. be a place where you could organize games. Well, let let, let, let me. Uh, um Come come back to that point in just a second. Can I just ask you? Um, um, there was a question I wanted to to ask, but but I'll I'll, I'll just address the the game issue. That's kind of tricky because I, I don't want to say something absurd like you know that life right here is a game because that's not the case. The question I wanted to ask though are the people who are playing in this particular area. Do they? Um, well, I guess it would be hard to know. You'd have to. Um, like when if you participate are you participating in a rigorously in the voice of a character that has been created that's quite a challenge and do you have the sense that people are kind of slipping in and out of their real self and their avatar self or do they actually develop a an avatar which has a rigorously conceived and constructed voice well, I th no, I think, I mean, I'm a member of the group. I joined yeah. the group, so, but, uh, I mean, I joined it mainly just to find out how the whole thing works because it's kind of an area of research, I mean, it's uh, an area of research. So, uh, and the contacts I've had with the group uh, is more been talking about, discussing about possible uses of it. For example, beaming, yeah. because you can stream into Second Life. I mean, they have a s um, uh, um, distance learning island, or they used to have it. I don't think yeah. they have it anymore. And I was very interested in that because the idea there was that you could have, uh, you could beam in uh, lectures from, from real life. And yeah. then people could assemble there and uh, they could discuss with the people who are, um, and because you can, you know, you have a voice, you can use the, the Skype connection to talk yeah. to the people uh, in the real world from inside Second Life. And I found that quite interesting 
Uh, but whether it caught on or not, I don't know, because <coughs> there's a, uh, Antonio Di Pietro as well, uh, an Italian politician, he made it an enormous island in Second Life <laughs> to promote himself as a modern uh, politician who was in cyberspace, etc. And they invited all their, uh, his supporters to come there and he held a speech to them. It was put on, it was put on YouTube. But then again, that's, it's, 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 it's not a game now. That's, that, that, poli yeah. that's political. You, you, that's, you, you, political yeah. that's political. Uh, uh, political marketing. Not so only is <laughs> yeah, not only is it not a game. It's um, it would be a de um, definitional evil from my no, revisions. No, no, no. For, for, from the standpoint of my suggested revision and my alternative definition, which takes more seriously Second Life than obviously um, the founder and many of the adherents of Second Life. For example, the people who are talking about. Um, Building the you know a better palazzo or whatever, um, well, they're they're they're, 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 they're they're not playing a game. They're yeah, they're they're, way, they're, they're, they're 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 doing something. They're they're in trying to enhance the space. And part of my recommendation it might seem absurd, but part of the recommendation, and that's all, all I have to defend, mm. not Second Life as it exists. Mm. Just as Aristotle doesn't have to defend an episodic tragedy, he only has to defend tragedy as he's conceived of it. Um, my, um, my whole thing is that eliminate space. So it would also eliminate all of the kind of activities, ancillary activities that are involved in that. So it would be a very low level um, interface that wouldn't require people to s waste time doing these clunky things. It would be a space where people use their, what's inside here, to develop a, a rich, rigorous character that it, in doing so, they would reflexively be expanding their own horizons, and then to yeah, actually put that character into discourse practice. Yeah. But that, that for me is now, now it should it would be no longer Second Life. So no, but they, that's, they, a, that's, yeah. a, that's a bit new age. You know, this is the idea. It's kind of transformed. Well, I, no, I, I I'm very yeah. down to earth about this kind of thing. But I mean, yeah. it's all important to remember too that Second Life is a commercial project because yeah. if you want to buy institutional space, you can pay a hundred thousand euro for it. Eh? Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, it's not a game. <laughs> well, no, no, I yeah, I, I agree. So it's it, the reason it's not a game is because it doesn't take its own concept seriously enough. But if it did, it would be a it would be a game. So we should um, invent a new game. We can't call it Second Life because that has a. Uh, this discussion Cut reminds rate. me of Hubert Dreyfus, who uh, <laughs> <laughs> has written a lot about Second Life. Are there any other questions for Michael? There is one. Oh, there. I was just interested. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. Um, I was just interested in the Aristotelian connection. Um, where would you see the unity of action in Second Life as necessary and probable? Um, uh, Aristotle talks yeah. of action as being necessary and probable, and where would you see the unity of action in Second oh. Life as being necessary and probable as well? Yeah. I'm not bringing uh, tragedy I in here, but I'm yeah. just talking about the plot in Aristotle. Yeah. And how does character develop in Second Life in Aristotelian terms? No, that's a good point. I think, I think um, interactivity has um, advantages and disadvantages, and one of the disadvantages is that you couldn't possibly develop a unified um, through a collaboration, collaborative effort of people developing themselves as characters and then simply talking about si philosophically significant things in Aristotle's sense. You, you couldn't develop um, a unified narrative artwork, so it would be radically distinct from narrative and dramatic art. It would be a totally different kind of enterprise and it would have disadvantages, but arguably, leaning on um, Daniel's point, it might also have certain special advantages if it was to go in that direction. But it certainly couldn't be a unified, because it takes a single author or people working in conjunction to create a work of art in that sense. So. Uh, I got just uh, two hints, and my question would be, what do you think about? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, the first one is that, yes, uh, the diff two different, at least two different concepts of mimesis or mimesis, Plato to Aristotle. Could we say that uh, the Aristotelian one matches somehow the idea of simulation? Because this mimetic mm -hmm. act is mm -hmm. not reproducing something that's already there, but it's anticipating something that could be. So children 
pretending to be parents, it yeah. could become parents. So this would be the idea of simulation. This would fit your idea of... I would agree um, yeah? completely with that okay. characterization. And yeah. of course, then the second one, this could be backed from game theory uh, uh, with KOR, that he not uses the uh, concept of mimesis or mimesis because yeah. he wants it not to be confused with the Platonian idea of ah. um, mimesis but uh, with the Aristotelian, and that's why he introduced the term of mimicry, because uh, okay. yeah. mimicry is also to pretend to be something else and not in the way of depicting it, because a picture could always be a t told apart from the original. So I, 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 would resi I, I, I see, um, you know, in line with what pa Patrick was saying earlier, mimicry and imitating, I would tend to resist that a and simply lean on the um, you know, the critical tradition where mimesis has been used um, in a richer way than simply mimicry. I think it can be more inventive. I mean, when Aristotle talks about music being the most mimetic of the arts, I, I, I really have no idea what he's saying, but, he, but um, he, he, it seems that um, mimesis is more transfiguring and mimicry seems to be a little closer to copying. I th I might, I might have a fragile grasp yeah, yeah, of no, the no, word it's mimicry, not, I don't, I don't say, it's just interesting that Kaiwa is avoiding the term in when it comes to games. Yeah. That's all. I, I don't think they are they totally I equal, but I just I to, yeah. yeah, I would link up with what Patrick said, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, an, it's, a, it's a term that's up for grabs, and I guess it would have to be fleshed out, you know, by whoever uses that term. So. Questions? I think we have time for one short question. Going one, two, <laughs> and three. Okay, thank you, Michael. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>